Welcome to the General Resonance Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a presentation by Dr. John Joe McFadden on the semi field theory. We now join this talk already in progress. So John Joe um, wrote a couple of hard hitting papers back in, I think, 02 um, that I read. And certainly I, I give you a lot of credit, John Joe, for my own um, evolution into thinking about EM fields as being a really key part of consciousness. So kudos to you for that. Um, John Joe is actually a biochemist. Um, by training, right? Your primary field is in biochemistry, uh, but you have like a lot of people in this, you know, budding field of consciousness kind of come from another field and made really similar contributions. It's an interesting phenomenon to me actually in itself, how there are so many people who have contributed who are not technically in the field. And I wonder if that's a sign of a very young field or a sign of just how ubiquitous, you know, this interest is. And I think probably a bit of both, right? Um, there's definitely, I think, a lot of room for exploration of different ideas here. Um, so John Joe had a, a, a well-reviewed and well-received paper, uh, was it in 2020, I think? Um, 2020, yes. Earth Science of Consciousness, sketching like out your latest paper on your, your CME field theory. So um, yeah, with that introduction, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Tam, and thank you um, uh, to all your colleagues for um, being here. and um, and um, what I'd like to do would be keep this as informal as possible. I'll give a uh, presentation, which is not really going to go into any, any detail. It's um, um, any great detail, but um, it will outline the theory. And, um, and please feel free to interrupt and comment at any point, ask questions, um, as I think what's... Um, what is important in, in consciousness research is to get to rightly ask the right questions. And I think that's really vital. And I think well, in relation to Tam's point that a lot of people in, in consciousness, um, in the consciousness field have come to it from very different directions. And I'll briefly describe my own in a moment, but um, I think that's because uh, within the neurobiology field, I think consciousness is is a single is considered as almost a single road. It's kind of driven from the um, people who have been embedded in neuroscience only really just in the last decade or so, thinking about consciousness as being a respectable interest. But they're still very embedded in the in how the field of neuroscience has been driven for the last uh, many decades, and. That field, in my view, hasn't come anywhere close to solving the problem of consciousness. And I think it needs to come from, from other directions. And that's why people are approaching it from diverse directions. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll explain how I got into this, because I do feel somewhat um, bedeviled with what we call, I don't know if you know the term, imposter syndrome in, um, in consciousness studies. Um, and maybe we're all imposters in consciousness studies, but I got to it from a rather strange direction. I, um, I wrote this book um, back in 2000, well, it was published in 2000. It was actually on um, quantum biology, really, which is, I'm now director of quantum biology uh, research um, um, center here at Surrey. But it was about quantum biology and uh, I became convinced um, um, through work coming from several directions, so in some from my own work, but um, that life was fundamentally quantum mechanical. And, um, and the business of life, the really interesting business of life goes on at a quantum mechanical level. And this seemed to be, came as a revelation to me that this strange science of quantum mechanics might be involved to account for life. So I, I thought this was such a good idea. I put together a book proposal, which was accepted by um, my publisher at the time, Harper Collins. And um, it included a, a section on, on um, quantum consciousness. And uh, I think uh, one of you was later, was interested in quantum consciousness at, at one point, uh, but uh, it included a section which was based on the um, Roger Penrose, uh, Stuart Hammerhoff idea, which, at that time, when I was putting the book proposal together, I wasn't really very clear about it. I didn't really, I hadn't really looked into it in any detail. Um, but anyway, the book 
book was commissioned, I started to write, write the book and came to chapter 13, which is my um, chapter on, on consciousness. And uh, Nicole Johnson is in the waiting room and I've just uh, let Nicole in. Um, I came to, uh, by the way, before I start rambling like this, is the time fairly uh, loose, the end point? Of we, we have an hour and a half. Um, an hour and a half. Roughly, okay. yes, I'd say, you know, limit your content to an hour and then okay. half an hour Q&A. Okay, good, 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 fine. Uh, so I came to study, then when I started writing the book, I found out a lot more about quantum mechanics and how it could work in biology and what the key aspect of it that uh, uh, came out is that really quantum biology had to involve small components of life, you know, a few atoms, protons, say electrons, uh, maybe photosystems and the insides of the active site of an enzyme. But it was very unlikely to involve big stuff, like what's going on in a brain, like you see here. That couldn't be a coherent quantum mechanical entity. I became convinced by that. And that kind of threw me in chapter 13 because I had based it on the idea of quantum consciousness and, the Pen and that was Penrose Hammerhoff's idea that was put together by microtubules that remain coherent throughout the brain. And I just was completely convinced that that was impossible um, from what I knew from quantum mechanics. So I was then floundering around looking for a way to account for consciousness. I was convinced by that time, and I think it was from reading Penrose's book, that consciousness was some kind of field. And we'll come to that in a moment. Some kind of field. So I was looking around, well, is there another kind of field in the brain? Essentially, Penrose and Hammerhoff had proposed it was a quantum mechanical matter field, something similar to a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that just doesn't work above absolute zero for more than a few atoms, really. So um, I couldn't believe that that was the case. But is there some other kind of field in the brain? And then I could, of course there is. We've known about it for over a century, the brain's electromagnetic field that we've been detecting with techniques like EEG and MEG for um, more than a century or decades for MEG. Um, so we knew there was a, a field in the brain and we knew that the field was generated by the brain activity. And I thought, well, why don't people shift simply from the matter of the brain to the electromagnetic field of the brain? And the more I started thinking about it, the more it made sense. So here are um, my thoughts, really. So first of all, we have to identify what the problem is. Why is consciousness so hard to explain? So these are, are kind of problems that I, um, I will pick up at, on as we go along. So the hard problem, why is consciousness, why is matter, why is this wet stuff inside our head aware that it, aware that it exists? That's the hard problem as I think Chalmers um, outlined. How problem, how, for example, how various things happen in the brain. For example, the binding problem. On the left, you see um, an illustration, a cartoon illustration of all the different things that you might have in your head. But the key thing, about conscious experience, it contains lots of information that is distributed in the brain. How does it come together to form um, our thoughts? Why not? So clearly a lot of what our brain does, the kind of things I'm doing with my hand as I talk, the kind of motions of my lips and tongue when I speak, these are highly complex phenomena, highly complex actions, forming words, for example, um, speech is an extraordinarily complex achievement that is done entirely non-consciously. We aren't conscious of doing it. What is it that makes some kinds of mental phenomena, mental feats really, conscious and some non-conscious? What is the difference between them? Any theory of consciousness that doesn't have some way of dividing between most of our brain's activity, which seems to be non-conscious and the stuff that is, isn't really a theory of consciousness. Unless you'd account for that, you don't account for consciousness in my view. Um, what correlates there are, what does consciousness correlate with? Is That's a useful way of, of determining what its physical substrate is. And this is what I'm talking about. What is consciousness is physical substrate? And why, why is it correlated? Where is the seat of consciousness? What is free will? Why isn't AI conscious? I mean, we've had predictions going back as long through most of my life, and I'm older than most of you, um, that uh, you know, AI is going to be delivering 
uh, conscious computers, computers capable of the kind of general intelligence that we can uh, talk about today, um, talk to each other today with. And yet it hasn't happened. And yes, it could be that it's, again, as the AI enthusiasts have been predicting, it's about a decade or so away, and it could be a decade or so away. But my feeling is it's, it's, never, um, it's never going to be realized unless we have a fundamentally different theory of consciousness to the, to the predominant one. So first of all, the binding problem of, of consciousness, what uh, do we mean by that? And uh, I think it's illustrated in, uh, uh, best illustrated often with um, uh, visual illusions, such as uh, this impossible triangle. And uh, to ask the question, well, when we look at that triangle, we see it and we see its impossibility, we see that it's a problem, and we see it as a whole object. And it doesn't make sense if it's stuck into parts. You could dissect the triangle into its lines, its, its corners, its colors, etc. And it isn't a problem. It's only a problem to us. It's only a impossible object as a whole object. So where is that whole object encoded in the brain? And that to me is an illustration of, of the problem, of the binding problem. Um, it's also so this is really what uh, uh, is also here as well. Objects are experienced holistically joined up Gestalt information. So this is a realization that goes back to the early 20th century with the Gestalt psychologists, um, that they claim that the first um, items of perception are Gestalts, the whole objects, and then we can dissect them, but we actually perceive whole objects first. So where are these whole objects, the gestalt objects encoded in the brain, when we know that all neurons see is their firing rate? A firing rate is all a neuron knows. How is it all brought together? Joined up information and meaning. And this is, I think, is fundamental to consciousness, that we get meaning only in our conscious mind. Meaning doesn't exist in non-conscious in our non-conscious minds that still do marvelous things it exists in our conscious mind and it's geshed out in the sense that the, a sentence is perceived as a the parts of a sentence are perceived as parts of a whole and that's uh, really can be illustrated by this sentence the pen is pen is full of ink and the meaning of pen is very clear until we put change one word not pen but a word at the end of the sentence and now pen has a completely different meaning. So the meaning of the word pen is derived from the whole sentence. How is that achieved in the brain? Um, again, uh, the different components of, of a pen may be encoded in different parts of a brain, whether it's a, a pen and ink pen or a pen that might uh, be chased by a, a wolf um, and uh, kept in a pen um, to protect it. Those are complex objects consi consisting of lots of diverse uh, bits of information, and yet they're encoded and perceived as a whole. And um, uh, as uh, Wittgenstein has said, that we understand the meaning of a word when we hear it or say it, we grasp it in a flash. And what we grasp in this way is surely different from the use, which is ex extended in time. Now, this is, I think, a key question. I've underlined extended in time because most of the ideas about how information is bound in our conscious minds are binding in time, but we don't grasp information bound in time. We grasp it bind instantaneously. And if it's diverse information, it's got to be spread somewhere. And if it isn't spread in time, it's got to be spread in space. In other words, it's got to be a field. John, you're going to ask you a question there real quick. Sure. This um, may be getting ahead of your presentation, so feel free to tell me to, no. to hold it for now. But um, it seems to me that it's spread in space and time. Right? Is it? I mean, isn't a single mo Like, if we go back now, I'm, for some reason, my, um, my computer isn't responding to my, um, my request to... Ah, here we go. Right, we're back. If we go back to um, the impossible triangle, is that extended in time? I can't see any evidence that it is in my mind. It's a single object extended in space. 
Well, I guess what I'm suggesting, and this is also based on my reading of your paper, um, the moment of integration, the moment of understanding, the moment of perception, those are moments in time, um, even yes. though the object itself sure. is in space, right? So yeah. isn't it kind of just hopelessly entangled as a spatiotemporal gestalt? I, I would say not in that um, the impossible, I, I think it's something we could argue about, but the impossible triangle and other things, I think are seem to be in, to me, they're, they're in a moment of time. That moment can be extended. It can be many moments. It can, it can watch that triangle over many seconds or minutes and it'll still be there. But ultimately, I believe it's there in a moment, a perceptual moment of time rather than rather than um, one, uh, because it changes from, it can change from one moment to the next. But I, we can come back to this, uh, um, I think. It, it is an interesting question um, that we'll maybe return to. So, and I illustrated this in, because I always had difficulty explaining this. Obviously, the, as everyone knows, the most prevalent and uh, prominent theory of um, consciousness at the moment is integrated in information theory. Um, uh, promoted by um, uh, first um, uh, promoted by Tononi and then picked up by an awful lot of uh, um, different researchers and El Seth, for example, in his uh, very good recent book on, on consciousness and talk about integrated information. So they agree in Tononi's integrated information theory, IIT, there's, um, he talks about information integration being essential for consciousness. And I agree with him on that. But what I don't agree with, with him and the integrated information theory is the kind of integration that they are thinking about. And this reminded me of a problem in philosophy. I'm not a philosopher, but I have an occasional interest in philosophy. And it goes, uh, I can't remember which philosopher came up with it, but the problem is someone who, um, it turns out to be a woman, I don't know why, why it should be, it turned up in Cambridge or Oxford, I can't remember which university, but, um, and asked where is, um, she went, visited the library, she visited the factory, she visited this building and that building, and then she turned to someone and said, where is the university? And of course they said, well, it's everywhere. It's no, it doesn't have a physical location in space, it's everywhere. It's, but is, in what sense is it everywhere? That's a kind of really deep question. In what sense is the university everywhere? To a certain extent, I think consciousness is like that, the university. And I think what integrated information is can be illustrated if we look at, for example, how a university generates the offer of a place. So it will, um, uh, people at the university, the uh, maybe computers also at the university will, will input various bits of information like exam results, like the candidate CV, like a letter from the candidate. Uh, if they have to pay for their uh, uh, study, then they have to look into the financial situation of the candidate. And all of that information is integrated and, and processed in various ways within the university, maybe computational, it may involve a lot of people until eventually it sends out an offer or not of a place. Now, in that sense, the offer of the place at the, university of, at the University of Cambridge here integrates all of the information that went into that offer. Is that really integrated? Because all of that information is just different people looking at bits of paper here and there, um, exam results that have gone on in a different city, maybe on a different continent, letters, monies held in a bank, do we really think that that letter at the end of that chain of causal, causally related events integrates the information that preceded it? It doesn't. It's just a causal chain. What is happening? It's integrated in time in the sense that uh, the offer letter is dependent on things that have happened earlier in time. And we tend to call that integrated. So the offer letter integrated all of its information, just like say the weather forecast will be integrating all sorts of information about wind direction, temperatures, um, the, uh, the temperature of the sea, of the ocean, as well as the uh, temperature on land, all of these uh, things will be integrated to generate a weather forecast. But do they really integrate storms in the Atlantic and Pacific with, you know, the temperature in, in Brighton or, or Guildford 
They don't. And this is a big difference. Everyone's using this word integrated when we don't really define what we mean by integrated. And for me, integrated is, is not this causal integration, or you can, of course, everyone, everyone can make their own word meanings, but it's clearly not physically integrated information. Similarly, computers integrate information. So here's a simple um, AND gate, and it integrates two bits of information from its inputs to generate one bit of information in its outputs. This is an important part of temporal integration. It usually ends up with less information. Uh, so, um, but that's what computers do. And every computer on the planet integrates information in this way, which is um, exactly the same kind of way that we're talking uh, neurons work. And neurons do do this form of information. They take their many inputs <laughs> and integrate that information, do some kind of information processing on that information to generate a single output, its firing rate. But that output is even physically separated on the... Um, uh, well, it's temporally se separated because it happens after the inputs have taken place in the neuron. So the information coming into the neuron has gone. And it will still generate its output, which will just be a zero or one. If that's how most people think a neuron works, it's only binary. It could be more complex, but it's certainly uh, some um, condensation of information. A lot of the information has been thrown away in order to get the output. So com computers and neurons work in the same kind of way as the University of Cambridge works in generating offers. They're te great, uh, bringing together a lot of information, integrating that information in a temporal way, uh, which is essentially information processing to generate an output. But it isn't physical integration. You, in, at least in a neuron, all of the inputs have gone by the time the um, output is generated. So, um, so this is another illustration of the problem. What our brain sees is lots of integra integrations going on in different parts of our brain that might be analyzing a scene, such as if you look carefully, it's the University of Cambridge picture there, which is now taken apart. Different bits of that will be analyzed by different neurons. And each neuron will, be, will have its inputs, which might have to do with the color of the brick on the university. It might have to do with the function of the university. All of those things maybe is dissected into probably billions of neurons to get our perception of what a university is. But each neuron sees only one tiny fragment of that. We can ask the question, the famous question from Thomas Nagel, who asked, what is it like to be a bat? And he concluded that we can't really know. But what I think is interesting to ask is what it's like to be a single neuron. For example, in the other famous uh, um, uh, psychological problem uh, of understanding what neurons, such as uh, a neuron that responds specifically to Jennifer An Aniston's face, does it really know what Jennifer Aniston looks like? Of course not. All it knows is its firing rate. And its firing rate is just that. Whoops, go back. I can do that. So it's all it knows is its firing rate. Okay, I'm trying to do this the way I did it before, but it's not working. Okay. And it, essentially, its firing rate, it just fires. That's all a neuron knows. That's all it can ever know. And all the brain, the, uh, the matter of our brain, is neurons which just know their firing rate. Now, you can talk about some higher level integration going on, but it's the same kind of integration as generates an offer to, a, to a, a, a student going to the University of Cambridge. That letter does not contain all the information that went into the writing of that letter. Hey, John, so, um, yep. this again may be a question you'd rather hold to later, so let me know. But um, there certainly is um, a suggestion out there in the, uh, mm. the ether that the neuronal consciousness might be its own level of consciousness so it may be because of course it's not just you know um a firing there's obviously a lot going on in neurons they're complex creatures highly complex um are you open to the possibility of a neuronal level of integration information beyond just uh, kind of purely mechanical approach not really i mean ultimately 
all we can know about consciousness, all we can judge about consciousness is the outputs of conscious minds. Now we can speculate on, um, on whether a neuron is conscious uh, or uh, whether a chair is consciousness or my toaster is conscious, is conscious, but ultimately if it doesn't generate an output that reveals the kind of complexity of information processing that is in a conscious mind, then we might as well say that tables and chairs are conscious. All a neuron's output is, as far as we know, what goes on inside it, of course, lots of things, not only the information processing stuff, but ribosome um, uh, translation of proteins, transcription, translation, metabolism, all of these things are going on inside a neuron. Much more complex than a table or chair. Do we just highlight one part of what goes on in a neuron in terms of its information processing capacity and say it's aware of that rather than its metabolism or its RNA processing or its DNA, which we're not, we can't really imagine a neuron being aware of that, but that's also information in the neuron. Ultimately, the only output it has is its firing rate. And that I would say in terms of consciousness, that's the only thing we can go on. We've got to look at the outputs of consciousness as far as we know, the only output that neurons have is their firing rate. And that I think can't really correspond to what I would call a conscious mind. What goes uh, can on I, the, yeah. can yeah. I okay. chime one in here? John, sorry, one follow up real quick. Um, so if you look at um, LFP data, and if you look at, as you are in your theory, EM fields oh. being possibly the primary locus of consciousness, I think you would agree there is an integration of EM fields going on at the neuronal level. So even though we're looking in, the, in this example, you're looking at now at neural firing, there's of course a lot more complexity to the EM field dynamics than just neural firing. So wouldn't there be some possible integration at the cellular level under that paradigm? Uh, possibly, although integration of EM fields is a kind of, interesting thing and i'm not sure i haven't even got my brain around it completely there is only one em field in the entire universe now that's a kind of stunning concept but there is there's only one em field that fills the entire universe so is anything unintegrated in the universe so we can talk about a neuron maybe integrating information in the em field but there is only one em field the brain has only got a single EM field and it can be, because information in it is traveling at the speed of light, any part of the brain can access any of the information in the brain. So is there integration going on between the, um, between the EM field and the neurons? I'm not sure that there is because every neuron has access to exactly the same information, exactly the same complexity of information. Of course, I suppose it, you can say that it might integrate it in the sense that one neuron will be provoked to fire and another one will be provoked not to fire, but they're provoked either to fire or not to fire with exactly the same information. Uh, from the EM fields perspective, of course, then the information coming in from, from the matter-based dendrites will be different and that might be enough to provoke one neuron to fire and one not to fire. So it will be matter-dependent um, I would call it receiving of information from the brain's in the field, but it's a deep problem, I think, and it's one I've been wrestling with when uh, I, I read, for, it's actually from uh, Sean Carroll's book that um, um, pointed this out. There's only one EM field in the entire universe. And that to me is a profoundly interesting question when we come to ask about consciousness. Um, it is super interesting. Yeah, and I just suggest yeah. that we can move on to Jonathan's question. I suggest that synchrony of the various levels of EM fields is the key for what is integrated at each level of complexity. Okay. That's what we're okay. kind of looking at with our approach. Mm -hmm. but Jonathan, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, and you can even just sort of do yes, no's on this, uh, just to sort of figure out where you are in the space. Am I hearing you right that you don't think there, that, that your best guess is that there's nothing it's like to be a neuron, question one. And then secondly, what about a single celled sort of more independent organism like an amoeba or a slime mold? I think uh, to a certain extent, I think the best way of approaching that question is what is it feasible to answer? Can we 
ask a neuron independent, anything independent of its firing rate? Can we investigate it in any way that would tell us whether its experience is any different than just a single firing rate? If we can't really, in, in the same sense, it's just asking the question, it, it, it is the panpsychism question, of course. And I kind of duck it by asking, well, I can only, asking a question like whether my toaster is conscious, I can't really answer it one way or another. You could propose that it's conscious, but you can't prove it's conscious. I think the only way we can prove a conscious being is to, is to have some criteria for conscious outputs. And conscious output, I would say, would be something that, um, that uh, demonstrates thinking, something, and for that, that's gotta be something that's got either language in it or some creative kind of um, output. And a neuron doesn't have that. Um, now, if you could plug something into a neuron and it could you know, come up with a song or, or tell me something more interesting than its firing rate, then I would accept that maybe it has some inner, inner state. But I don't think we can talk about inner states unless they have outer states that correlate with them. What about dogs? <laughs> just, just sort of wear up and down the... Um... Okay. Genetic thing. Um, Dogs, I would, I would again, fish. I think we can only guess at the moment. We only guess until we know what consciousness is, then we can't, I think everything else is a guess. Okay. So I would guess that dogs and mammals and uh, are conscious um, because, but I, I, if we knew, so my idea that the consciousness is the brain's EM field, but it's the brain's EM field acting on the neurons of the brain to drive conscious actions such as speech, such as um uh, uh creativity um that's got to be what consciousness is in my theory so if you have a brain an electrical brain it's always generating an electromagnetic field uh, for it to be classified as conscious in my theory is that it's going to generate an output so i think it would be really interesting to look at dogs and humans and fish and amoebae uh, etc to ask the question do the am fields that they are generating, do they have outputs or are they just being generated but without an output? The steam whistle argument about EM fields, which has been the dominant feeling about what the EM fields are in the brain. They're, they may be complicated, but they don't have an output. Now we know they do have outputs. Clearly they do influence neural firing. Um, and that to me is, is the key aspect of consciousness. Now I could imagine in say dogs and, uh, and, and uh, um, other animals, that there may be a kind of awareness that doesn't have an output. You could, you can, you know, you could imagine being, I'm looking and in a small room at the moment, and I could just be looking at it without being able to access it at all, without being able to interfere with it at all. And maybe there's a kind of awareness that precedes consciousness. To me, consciousness, has always got to have an output, otherwise we can't really talk about it. But there could be an awareness that precedes it, in which the EM field is there, and it does have some kind of brute level of awareness, but it doesn't have an output yet. And I think the key moment in the evolution of the conscious mind is when it, it uh, managed to plug into the brain to generate outputs. And that's the key point at which consciousness started to make a difference to the world. Before that, it was dumb. It couldn't do anything. And I think at some point in our history, it started to make a difference. Now, my guess, it's some point before the origin of modern humans, that maybe uh, that uh, uh, certainly primates, um, you kind of get an instinct that there's something going on in their minds that they are thinking. Fish, I'm not so sure about. And somewhere in between, I guess, that um, impact of the brain's in field on the matter of the brain started to have an impact. We don't know exactly when it, it, it happened, but I guess it happened somewhere in the evolution of, of higher mammals. Well, I'm going to give this bird credit too, but thank you. <laughs> you know, um, this is obviously a huge question in itself. And I'm reading right now um, Douglas Field's book, The Other Brain, which is all about glia, which comprise about you know, 90% of the matter of the brain. And we're learning more and more that glia have, you know, many functional roles. Uh, they're not just, you know, packing material. And um, I learned also that basically, you know, glia are the cause 
um, behind myelination, which leads to a dramatic increase in um, the speed of electrical flows down axons and dendrites. And so if you don't have myelination, then you have far slower um, EM field and electrochemical propagation. And apparently, this is interesting, vertebrates only have myelination, not invertebrates. And so, you know, if you're looking for any kind of um, step function change in the rate of EM field propagation in the brain, looking to vertebrates certainly seems to be a pretty good um, space to look. But just more generally, you know, as you know, you know, from our prior conversations and in our interview, John Joe, um, I am a card carrying panpsychist, not for a religious reason, but because I think the, the logic and the data um, kind of leads us there. And in terms of these, um, these dualities you're suggesting in terms of, you know, either or black and white distinctions, we look to biology, we don't see that kind of black and white distinction. The myelination thing I just mentioned is sort of in a category, but not entirely, because of course the brains and in, invertebrates are still neuronal, even though if they don't have glia, they're still neuronal, they're still doing the same kind of thing. So they're still producing EM fields. So do we see in biology any basis for this kind of black and white, yes, consciousness, no consciousness kind of um, thing? Well, we do in the origin of life, I guess. Um, we kind of think of that as being a singular and we do think of life as being a clearly dis a clear distinction between the living and the dead. Um, and, um, so there is a binary choice there in, uh, to most biologists at least. I know viruses kind of sit somewhere on the border, but uh, in terms of, of life, we think of it as being a binary thing. So I kind of think of consciousness that it might have been a binary thing like that when EM fields generated uh, uh, EM fields which contain this integrated information as we'll be going on to look at why it's integrated, but EM fields do clearly can, uh, are composed of integrated information. When that started to make a difference, and I think it only started to make a difference in brains because I think, well, certainly the kind of complex information that is in brains only influences brains. And um, I think that was a kind of binary event somewhere in, the evolution, in our evolution when the kind of complex information generated by brains, all their sensory perceptions, et cetera, and processing, um, all of that became integ integrated in, in the brain's EM field. And initially it was probably dumb. And at some point, bang, it plugged into the brain again. Okay, shall I, shall I move on from there? We'll come back to it, I'm sure, as it is the fundamental problem, but let's, uh, moving on. So this then illustrates it. What we're really talking about is a difference now between uh, particles and waves. And this comes down to quantum mechanics, that a wave is, is um, non-localized information. It's uh, fields that are, um, uh, are non-localized in space, uh, but they contain a huge amount of information. And I just want to point it, uh, uh, this is one of the uh, illustration from my recent paper in Neuroscience of Consciousness, it's when people talk about integration again, what do we mean by integration? I don't think matter is integrated in the way, it, it clearly isn't integrated in the way that fields are. And we can see this in, in physics in the de Broglie wavelength. The de Broglie wavelength of particles is, um, is inversely proportional to their mass. So the bigger the mass, the smaller the wavelength. So objects like atoms, the de Broglie wavelength, which de Broglie wavelength is the kind of wave mechanical aspect of a particle. And it doesn't even extend as far as the particle itself. So the Broglie wavelength is very small for atoms, but as objects get smaller like electrons, the de Broglie wavelength is more distributed. So, uh, so what is integrated? So atoms don't have integrated information because their information encoded in the atom is within the particle and their de Broglie wavelength is smaller than the atom. So there's, these are discrete particles. There's no such thing as integrated information at a matter level. But if you talk about electrons, then you can have integrated information because electron is a particle which has a certain size or, we, or can be seen as having a certain size, but the electromagnetic field perturbation of the, of the particle extends in space. So there are some, if you have a number of electrons, as for example, in the benzene ring where the pi electrons are, uh, are, are delocalized, then the information in those electrons 
is integrated information because the information overlaps. So you can have an overlapping region where information will uh, be integrated. Uh, so it's very different from this situation with the atoms. And then, of course, if uh, we're talking about photons, the particles of the electromagnetic field, they have zero mass. So their information is, is completely delocalized. So that's why we have a single electromagnetic field for the entire cosmos. And all of the information is completely delocalized and available everywhere in, in the electromagnetic field. So that is the most integrated information. And we know that um, in, say, a magnet, we know, um, I think uh, I use this to, to talk about information, like this is a picture of Robert Downey Jr. And it's drawn with a magnet, with magnets. Uh, by an artist. I, uh, in my paper, you'll get the name of the artist. I've forgotten okay. uh, the guy's name for the time being. Um, and it represents, it represents information that is distributed in space. Distributed in space rather than time. And that information can be very complex. It can get encoded a face like Robert Downey Jr.'s. And it's available at any point in space. And we can download it on our computer because the EM field that fills this room, for example, is available at any point in my room. So that information is distributed in space. And the other th aspect of it, it performs a calculation. So this picture of Robert Downey Jr. Uh, is just formed by sprinkling iron, iron, iron filings on the sheet of paper. It's just a, uh, a sheet of paper really. And then the artist sprinkles iron filings on it because he's situated magnets behind the paper. And you can see the information, but it's there, sorry, it's there invisible on the paper. And that information does a lot of calculations because it's telling the iron filings where to go, how to align themselves. So at every point on that piece of paper is a complex calculation, which, uh, um, which is about the electro, uh, electrical and magnetic component of the electromagnetic field at each point in space on the paper. So that information uh, the, uh, or the electromagnetic field performs a calculation, it performs a computation. And it's that computation which generates the image. So what I wanted to really emphasize there is that EM fields that perform computations. So you can imagine an EM field computer. Instead of have, having EM fields like the traditional type we looked at earlier with two inputs and an output, you could have an EM field, which is an EM field computer in which you have an output, which depends on EM field in this point of space. And then we could have two inputs, which could be some kind of, um, uh, um, some kind of uh, frequency modulator here and another one here. This one is on and it generates a, a pulsed signal. This one is off and it doesn't generate anything. And the output um, uh, neuron output circuit or whatever could be uh, placed here. And it would depend on its inputs. In this case, these input, inputs could correspond to a one or a zero. So it could be a, um, uh, uh, an if gate, uh, which will only respond, no, it's an AND gate, which only responds if both of its inputs are on. So an electromagnetic field computer that computes through fields can compute in exactly the same way as a digital computer. It's a Turing, it could be a Turing machine, so it can perform any general computation, but it does it with fields. This is what I believe is happening in the brain with consciousness. It's computing with fields rather than bits. And that's a very different kind of computation because it's obviously computing with vast amount of quantities of information available for every neuron, available to every neuron in the brain. And it also doesn't, sorry, it do, also doesn't have the compression that we saw with the digital information processing in a computer or in a neuron in which information is lost in the processing that all of the information is present at the point of time when its output is generated. So you can imagine both the output and the inputs are present at the same point in time and at the same points in space. 
it's integrated both in space and time. So this uh, is then um, uh, uh, exemplifies the difference between matter and com based computation and EM field computation. Matter is discrete and localized in space and time. So conventional digital computation is never bound, despite all of the claims of integrated information either in computers or neurons. It's not. It's just causally integrated. It's a it's an effect, the output is an effect that depends on many causes. That is not physical integration that can correspond to that impossible triangle in my mind. Uh, EM field processing is distributed and unified within a single instant of time, it is bound. But, so I propose that this is really what consciousness is, that would make a very clear prediction because the only way this works, this processing is if the processes of synchronous, of firing synchronously. EM field processing requires the processes to be firing synchronously. So it predicts that conscious information should be associated with synchronous, synchronously firing neurons. I haven't explained why, I, I should have done that in, in another slide, why they have to be firing synchronously. If you think about the waves, waves in the sea or anywhere, if they fire asynchronously, they tend to, as in a very choppy sea, they tend to average to zero. So the information is lost. Whereas if waves are in step firing together, then they, that's what's called constructive interference, that they will interfere with each other and reinforce each other. And that's like the waves in the sea when you see them rolling onto the beach, all the waves are in step and you see the, uh, and you can see the waves. If you have a very choppy sea caused by storms where waves are coming in asynchronously, then the sea is calm. And um, uh, it, they all cancel each other out because the peak of one wave meets the trough of another and they average to zero. So asynchronous neuronal firing will not generate a net EM field. It will generate a zero EM field. The only, the EM field of the brain has only is only really made by synchronously firing neurons. So the EM field theories of consciousness make a very strong prediction that consciousness should be correlated with synchronously firing neurons. And of course- hey, uh, John Joe, can I, can I uh, ask a question um, on your previous yeah. slide? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, so in like, I guess like modern quantum computation models, there's sort of a digitization phase where, you know, you can have the sort of wave function, EM field, sort of like integration, yeah, constructive, destructive interference, but then it always gets digitized um, for like the output step. Um, are you yeah. sort of viewing the, the neuron spiking as this like exactly. digitization? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then, and then, Okay, cool. And then one more, one more question. So I, yeah, I've been, uh, yeah, working with Jonathan thinking about, yeah, neurons as, yeah, as having, yeah, like, like, like focusing on the firing rate as sort of the input output. Um, but you, in practice, there's sort of this weird phenomena where a lot of neurons fire at like one hertz, three hertz, like very, very slow. And there's a lot of neurons firing even slower than that. So I think one thing I've kind of been faced with is um, that the firing rate of most neurons in practice is extremely slow. And so I've, I've kind of in my own thinking reassessed firing rate itself as like the input output. And like, um, what do you think about viewing it at like a more microscopic scale where you could have, yeah, uh, yeah, like postsynaptic potentials coming into a neuron, and then you have more like local ion channel reactions within a within a single cell, and maybe it's not like the collective reaction of the whole neuron in like that grandiose firing, which yeah probably contributes a lot, but you could have like sub threshold response profiles within a neuron contributing to like the EM field environment without necessarily reaching the spiking threshold. And then, and then you could have, yeah, the digitization step occurring at like a much faster frequency rate. 
uh, maybe a thousand hertz, hundred hertz, and like consistently occurring at a much faster rate because you're not requiring this like metabolically exhaustive macro response to be your input output. So yeah, what do you? Yeah. Well, first, I, I, I think this is a really interesting question and gets to the guts of what really is going on. And I think that's where my theory has to go to really kind of look at these kind of questions. My, without having really thought hard enough about it, I kind of think that the, the, these low frequency waves are like carrier, carrier waves in modulation of, of signals in, in electromagnetic communication. They, the, all the information isn't the wave, it's all the modulations of that wave, the mi microscopic modulations going on at the level of uh, individual neurons and maybe individual ion channels could be where the information is. And the frequencies, again, uh, again, I think we shouldn't think of consciousness coming down in a single neuron. I kind of think it's constantly being downloaded in a whole bunch of neurons across wide areas of the brain. So the frequencies of a single neuron aren't really significant. It's actually the frequencies that are going on throughout the entire ensemble of neurons, which are obviously at a hugely higher rate because so many neurons are firing in different parts of the brain. So it's a high frequency output into the brain, but it's, it's not a high frequency to an individual neuron. The information is, is being output into multiple neurons simultaneously. And it's that information which then generates our, our uh, conscious outputs of uh, speech or whatever. Okay. Uh, okay, so moving on then. So, uh, so the prediction of, of any uh, in field theory of consciousness, including my own, and I should point out there are several, several others, um, is that synchronous firing is, the, is going to be a correlate of consciousness. And that was shown by Wolf Singer back in the 1990s or 80s, I can't remember now and many other researchers uh, around that time and since. And it remains our best correlate of consciousness as far as I'm uh, aware, that it's the one that um, everyone goes to in terms of looking for information in um, consciousness. It's what the synchronously firing neurons are doing and what they are encoding seems to be the information that's in our conscious mind. Um, and uh, and that's been shown, and you guys are much more familiar with this kind of information um, than me, but as far as I know, that uh, still remains true that the best correlate of conscious information is it's the stuff that's in synchronously firing neurons. Um, and uh, yeah, so neuron communication. So what I emphasize is that the bulk of what the brain does is probably nothing to do with EM fields, and it probably is a steam whistle for most neuronal computations which don't involve EM fields. And this we call our non-conscious mind. This is all of the stuff that goes on which allows you to walk, which allows you to talk without thinking about it. And um, this, so EM field theories of consciousness don't pr propose that everything going on in neurons is going through the fields. It's probably only a tiny subset of the of neurons that are responding to the brain's EM field. Um, and um, uh, so, and that they're responding to synchronously firing neurons. Um, this is, I've already said, asynchronously firing neurons will cancel each other out at the EM field level. So you will then naturally get a situation in which, um, in which we know that neurons are, are sensitive to EM fields. Let's imagine sometime in, the, in our evolutionary history, that they were not very sensitive to EM fields. And then gradually as maybe neurons were packed more densely or the EM fields became stronger, some neurons started to be sensitive to EM fields. And there's two things that can happen. It can be beneficial. Well, there's three things actually. First, it can be have no influence at all on neural firing, fine. That's how it was going on before. But two new things could, be hap could happen. One, it could be beneficial. Two, it could be harmful. I imagine that both of those things happen. Once that situation is in place, natural selection will kick in. It will kick in to build on the advantages that neural, that EM field information can provide to neural processing uh, by amplifying those. And for those operations, such as say walking or talking or uh, doing all the, all the automatic stuff like blinking, et cetera, which, we don't want our conscious mind interfering with, 
all of those stuff, the brain, natural selection will kick in to insulate those activities from any, inf any interference from the brain's neon field. And this is where the myelin comes in, as, uh, as I think Tam mentioned. Myelin then comes in to help that kind of insulation. It gets signals to the uh, root very quickly, and they're less in, in, uh, affected by um, uh, EM fields. And then the brain would naturally evolve into a conscious and unconscious mind. And again, I come back to the original, one of the original questions. How do you account for the difference between neural, between conscious and non-conscious neuronal processing? As far as I know, no theory of consciousness accounts for that, except by just saying, well, one's more complicated than the other, one's this, one's that. In the EM field theories of consciousness, once you predict that EM fields affect neuronal processing, which we know they do, then natural selection predicts that our brain will evolve into an EM field sensitive system and an EM field insensitive system. That's what natural selection predicts. It's not a prediction of the theory. Once this is in place, natural selection will do this and you'll get a conscious and non-conscious mind. Uh, so uh, these are just some early references which demonstrated that, yeah, that neurons will respond to EM fields and EM fields of the strength of endogenous EM fields. These are two back in a uh, decade or so ago. There's been many, many more publications since then. Um, can I ask you a question there, John Joe? Sure. Uh, back up, please. Okay. Um, backing up for some reason doesn't work <laughs> okay, so well. It does not, it's not that important. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, this to me is super interesting and kind of like where the rubber hits the road, theoretically. And um, I'm curious what you think of the degree to which the brain's global EM field, um, as in your image here, is in some manner separate or above the neurochemical or neuro anatomical backbone, but then of course feeds back to affect neural firing, which then yeah. feeds the global EM field in this ongoing cycle of this gestalt. Yeah. How can we distinguish the levels in that gestalt, both conceptually and empirically? And of course we have studies like you mentioned and like Chang et al is a big one in 2019 that found clear evidence mm -hmm. of effective coupling and the global EM field affecting neural firing. Um, but since they are all clearly connected um, irredeemably, how do we separate them empirically to figure out what's actually going on with that kind of circular gestalt? Yeah, uh, I think because there is, um, I'm not sure if it helps, but I'll tell you, uh, I'm not sure if it answers your question. There is a fundamental difference between, uh, we, I think we've got to look at the properties of our conscious mind compared to our non-conscious mind, because as I said, we do lots of extremely complex, complex things non-consciously. So clearly our, our mind can do all this stuff without conscious uh, interference uh, or without conscious help. Um, but yet our conscious mind uh, can do um, uh, some different kind of things. And what are the different th kind of things that conscious mind seems to be required for? One of them is language, for example. We can't have natural language. We can't talk to, uh, oh, actually, let's go back a step. One of the features of non-conscious thinking is it seems to be a parallel processor. You can do lots of things at once. I can wave my hand, whistle a tune, so I, um, ride a bicycle and do lots of different things at once. Our non-conscious mind is a parallel comp computer, rather like a um, um, rather like a parallel parallel digital computer or um, a neural uh, network. Um, so, and they uh, you can do lots of different things at once. Our conscious mind can't do that. Uh, try uh, reading a book while uh, listening to the radio at the same time. You have to constantly switch between them. So there are differences in the properties of consciousness and non-conscious um, neural processing. And again, those need to be accounted for. And I, they're easily accounted for in the CMI field theory because the non-conscious stuff goes through neurons. They can independently work and do non-conscious things um, in, in parallel as many as you like because it's, it's a parallel computer, just like most computers. Uh, today and uh, neural networks, et cetera, can do lots of different things at once. 
our EM, our consciousness is our brain's EM field. Everything that goes on interferes with everything else because it's singular. As we were saying at the beginning, it's not, there's not only a single brain EM field, there's a single cosmos EM field. So everything that happens in the EM field interferes with everything else. And everything happens in our brain, in our conscious mind, interferes with everything else. So that's why we can't do two things at once consciously. We can only do one thing at a time. And that's, a, again, I don't know of any other theory of consciousness that accounts for that. But the field attenuates, right? So even though there is a single field, it attenuates, right? In terms of local information. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. yeah so absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Why I'm not feeling your personal awareness in my brain right now because you're because it's, when I'm here, right? Yeah, yeah. It, because it attenuates in, in space, it gets scrambled with more and more information the further it goes away. So uh, the field in our brain is mostly going to be um, subject to the EM fields generated by our brain, because we also know there's a frequency dependence on what uh, uh, EM fields will, will interfere with our brain. Uh, so um, there's a frequency dependence, there's a attenuation with distance, so that's why telepathy is impossible. Um, and um, um, if telepathy was possible, you could turn your head and it would get scrambled really, wouldn't it? Because it's coming in from different directions. So it's, uh, people always email me every now, every other week I get an email, oh, this isn't your theory explained telepathy. I say no. <laughs> so it's, uh, there are reasons to account for all of these feature attenuation. And I think an interesting question and one I need to explore more is the attenuation that goes on at the level of information in a single neuron, how far does it um, influence other neurons? And uh, those kind of questions I think are very interesting. Uh, but anyway, this is then um, uh, the, okay, yeah. So this is a, a kind of summary of where, of where the theory is at the moment, that um, consciousness is the component of the brain's EM field that is transmitted to neurons. So that's a key part of my theory, which, um, is different from some other EM field theories of consciousness, because I think consciousness must be capable of communicating with the outside world, because otherwise, what will, what are we doing talking about it? If it's uh, as I think uh, Chalmers um, wants to argue that uh, consciousness is an illusion, well, why are we talking about it if it doesn't have an impact on the world? Um, or, or theories of consciousness that don't that claim our conscious mind is is mute. Why are we talking about it if it's mute? It's certainly not mute. So it's got to, we've got to find a way of, com of our conscious mind communicating with the world. And if it's in the brain's EM field, we know what that route is. It's influence on neurons. So in, in my theory, free will is then our experience of the action of the brain's EM field on motor action. That is what we call free will. All these things that I do, which I'm not really aware of, like waving my hands around when I speak, that is driven by our non-conscious mind. But when I make a decision about, I'm going to raise my hand at the moment rather than dropping it, that's then a, an output of my uh, brain's EM field. Now, again, for some reason, my computer is doing this and I don't know why. Ah, there we go. It's, uh, so we've got this loop, a Gödelian loop, we could call it, in that the brain generates the brain's EM field, which then influences the brain. So we have a Gödelian kind of loop, which... Uh, um, of course, many philosophers have claimed as a, a fundamental feature of consciousness. It's there in the CMR field theory. Um, and I think I've said all of this. And the key question at the bottom of this is that um, AI isn't conscious because although computers generate EM fields, computers ignore them. They're built like I, I think early brains were built to work entirely through the wires. So that integration that is, could be occurring in the computing brain is ignored because um, computer engineers build their circuits to avoid um, uh, EM field interference. So AI will remain uh, entirely non-conscious and dumb because it won't be able to do the kind of things that we can do with conscious minds, which is think with whole concepts that are are, um, this is, I think, the fundamental thing that conscious minds have given us. Computers and neurons compute with digits. 
And all they can know, back to our early slide, is a one or a zero. That's all they ever know. They compute with tiny bits of information. It may be more complex with the neuron because it has more complex inputs than a, a computer bit, um, but um, a, a computer logic gate. But it's the same principle. It computes with very simple information. The Brainsian field computes with ideas, and ideas are complex information encoded in the Brainsian field that interact in order to generate outputs. And this is what is the gift of the brain of consciousness, the Brainsian field now acting on conscious mind, in which now we can think with ideas and our world can be driven by ideas, which are hugely complex, and they're downloaded, and this is, I think, an interesting part that I won't go into it in time. They still got to download those ideas to the neurons. So we've got to dissect them and send them down our neurons. And there's going to be some information loss from the ideas in our head to the ideas that we can communicate. And I think that's an interesting question. Um, uh, so, yes, so uh, CM Fields and AI, um, Gary Marcus, one of the pioneers of deep learning, um, uh, lamented the fact that um, you can, uh, you, uh, even the most advanced neural network couldn't work out how to uh, fix a bicycle that has a rope caught in its spokes. Something that a child could do on its first exposure to the problem say, oh, you just have to pull out the rope like this, and then you've got a working bicycle. No neural network in, in the world could solve that problem. That's because it's solved as an idea in an integrated space in our mind. And when you dissect that in the neurons, you won't find the answer. And that's why a non-conscious brain can't find the answer. But a conscious brain can. Similarly, computers can't find the answer because they're dissecting information. And the uh, solution is a complex idea encoded in the brain's EM field. Uh, and that's just recent work showing from Stanislav uh, Dain, which uh, indicates that uh, uh, our conscious mind, uh, what is our conscious mind for? Is to do those highly idea-based uh, information processing that leads EM fields rather than digits to process. Um, okay, um, and I think um, that's about it. That's the... Um, uh, so uh, I, one last point here. Uh, so those are just some uh, papers. Uh, one last point here. Once you get over the idea, everyone, when I first meant to say, okay, the consciousness of the brain is EM. Oh, no, surely that's crazy. It can't possibly be. Everything is EM. Everything is feels. Matter is feels. There's nothing wacky, non-physical or, or, the, uh, or um, mystical or anything about feels. They are just as physical as matter, but they're just distributed information rather than discrete wrapped up information in the particles of matter. Um, as shown in, in Einstein's famous equation, all you need to do is go over to the other side of it. You have matter on one side, energy on the other. Energy is a field, matter is particulate. All I'm asking people to do is to switch their attention from the matter of the brain to the energy, to the EM field perturbations that the brain generates when it does what it does. It's not anything, it's non, -mater it's non materialistic, but it's not non, it's not, uh, um, it's physical. It's still a physical phenomenon, but non material. Um, okay, and I think I've said all of that. So I think that's it. Oh, so I've just been through all the problems then of, uh, of um, consciousness that I highlighted before, and I won't go through them again. But I think the CMO field theory solves them all. I don't think any other theory of consciousness comes close to solving any of them. But, uh, um, um, but that's arguable, I guess. <laughs> okay, and I think that's it. Thank you very well, much. Thanks so uh, much. But that's really the key question to me. Where do we go from here? How do I prove this theory? Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Joe. Great stuff. Um, questions, anyone? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, Really, really very uh, uh, intriguing and, and uh, in many respects, compelling um, argument. I wonder about the sort of two lines that you've drawn uh, sort of in the sand. One with respect to what's conscious and there 
consciousness has very much this sort of a phenomenal experience of sort of drifting out into a into a fringe uh, where, mm. where you know when i'm driving i'm dimly aware of I, i'm i'm driving and so on so there's on the one hand the the sort of fringy end of consciousness mm. uh, in the phenomenal space and then in the unconscious level there are all sorts of processes that seem to have a uh, meaning going on processing going on at an un unconscious level so you have aha moments where a solution comes to mind and it seems very much as if the unconscious is processing it you have dream experience where although the dreamer i think is conscious of the dream there's some other process which is producing the whole dreamscape and oftentimes a very meaningful way so the 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 sort of the unconscious characteristics of consciousness and the sort of unconscious processes that have very much some of the qualities that you seem to be limiting to consciousness. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think there is more of a, I kind of think of it somehow like, it's like if we think of the surface of the ocean in a turbulent uh, um, ocean in which the unconscious mind is the ocean and the kind of spray, the haze above the ocean is the EM field. It's and there's constant movement between them, and both may be contributing to solutions. The non-conscious mind is uh, obviously a great problem solver. It solves loads of problems without us having to think about it every day, kind of problems that computers find it really, really hard to solve, like walking and playing tennis or something like this. You take hits without thinking about them. And in fact, what's interesting is that your conscious mind, if you start thinking about stuff, it interferes with your non-conscious mind ability to do stuff you you find it uh, you know if you're playing an instrument or something you start thinking about the notes and where you're going to move your fingers it'll all fall to pieces so there's um i think there's a dry there's stuff constantly going in and out between the conscious and non-conscious mind and i think that's a very interesting kind of phenomenon and we use both to solve even the most difficult problems it's not that all the problems are solved by the conscious mind the non-conscious mind can i think do a lot of problem solving for us and that could be when um our uh, uh when that's happening sometimes in our dreams and we wake up phew, we solved the problem we weren't aware of it i also i think our mind is working on different levels i sometimes find um that i'll be doing something and i never really realize my mind is is singing a tune a familiar tune that i i i, I sang this morning when i was listening to it on the radio or something and then later in the day, I'll, I'll just notice it's running, still running in my head. Where was it running before I, I started to pay attention to it? Where was it? Where was that happening? Was it in my non-conscious mind? Does it sing songs as well? I don't know. It's, so I think we have many levels in our mind. And if you like, the ones that we deal with are the kind of clearly non-conscious and the clearly, clearly conscious. But I think there's a lot of toing and froing and maybe different layers to to how it all works. Thank you. Hey, this is Nikki. Can I jump in with two things? Sorry, Nikki, Tanner had his hand up. Let, let, oh, let sure. Go first and then, yeah. uh, then you. No problem. Actually, Colin has his hand up too. Okay, okay then Colin, then, then Nikki. <laughs> uh, okay. Hi, yeah, so um, awesome talk. I really, I learned a lot. And uh, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to lead with a little quote that I like from, from kind of a, a humorous sort of enlightened guy. Um, and I just think it's good to set the tone. So he says, everything we think is real is an illusion. There is no such thing as, t as time or space, energy or matter. There is no universe and there is no you. That's what non-duality means. This isn't high philosophy. It's the end of philosophy. You can't prove anything because there's no such thing as objective knowledge. That's an actual fact. The, the kind that science can't afford to acknowledge, but you can. So that's an incredibly frustrating quote. I, I completely yeah. agree with that. It's one of the things which I think um, science has to learn is that all our science, all our knowledge of the world is stuff inside our heads. And I think the, when scientists, physicists realize that actually their theories are stuff inside their heads and all you're trying to do all the time is make predictions about the world that correspond to other people's predictions so you can uh, interact with them and uh, your own predictions about what's going to happen in a minute or so is time. 
but it's all stuff going on inside our head. And it's hard for people to grasp this, that, you know, I'm looking at a picture on the wall opposite me. That's inside my head. It's not on the wall, in the wall. I've, I've written another book recently. It's called Life is Simple. It's about William of Ockham and Ockham's razor. And he was an extraordinary philosopher in the medieval world. It said something uh, of this nature. I can't remember the words exactly, but it said, science isn't about things in the world. Science is about the statement we make about the world. And all we are trying to do is make consistent statements about the world. So really all of science is just outputs of our conscious mind. And that's why I think there may be a fundamental problem with trying to get a final answer from an objective science, because there's no such thing as you say, as objectivity, it's all in our mind. And I think we'll only really solve, provide the final solution to everything. When we take our mind into account, that's gotta be there because it is there. And it's got to be in the equation somewhere. And this is, I think, a fundamental problem in physics, which despite that still works very well and is fantastic at predicting stuff. But I think to get to the final solution, it needs to take into account that everything is in our mind and our mind plays a role. And, um, and I think that is a very deep and, um, and chastening um, experience. So one more thing before I let you go. Um, have you looked into sponges at all? sponges no yeah um, yeah like, it, whether they whether they have a consciousness or something i i, I know there's the work well uh, work of uh, this guy i've forgotten his name now i'm terrible at remembering names but he's done amazing work on looking at em fields in morphology the em fields are a kind of programming in development uh, frogs is a brilliant <laughs> called the uh, the um, the EM field face or something you can see in, in the development of a frog, EM feels swishing about in a frog embryo and forming, leading, if you like, the movement of, of, um, of uh, cells into the right places. And he's, his, his work, which uh, it'll come to me in a moment after I press the end here on this meeting, um, it'll, uh, well, this guy's name is, I think he's at maybe Tufts University, but He's done amazing work looking at the ear, role of EM fields in development, which I think could be preceding uh, consciousness, that there, was this, there is this kind of intelligence, EM field intelligence that um, uh, actually, um, uh, actually uh, was in solving problems in development millions of years ago. It's and Michael maybe, Levin. I just looked it up. Michael Levin, that's the man. Yes, I met him at a meeting, actually, a very nice guy. And uh, he does amazing work. And I think this is the, it could be the progenitor of consciousness, this kind of EM field that's involved in making our bodies. And, um, and then I think it's kind of moved its, its center act of activity into the brain. But in early, uh, in uh, more primitive animals, it's there making faces of frogs and tadpoles, um, uh, tadpole, uh, tadpoles' tails. And what he showed was if you disrupt the M field, you can disrupt development. So it's really playing a causal role. So we've got EM fields playing a causal role really early on in animal development, which I think is fascinating. Um, Nikki, go ahead. No, Colin. Was it Colin? Sorry, yeah. sorry, Colin. I didn't mean to give you Colin. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, wow, head spinning, so many questions. I'll try and be really quick. Um, the last slide had at the bottom, um, AI doesn't do this. In other words, produce the right fields. Um, but it but could be engineered. I'd just like you to, they produce EM fields, but not our kind of field. That, the production, the, engin yeah. the engineering of that is what I'm doing. I would okay. love someone to get into this. I did have a no. project, a proposal. Ben, what's going oh. on? Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is going on? I want to know as well. <laughs> um, I did have a pro project proposal, went to a, an EU wacky ideas uh, call for, and it was with Wolf Singer and some electrical engineers. And we wanted to build an EM field sensitive um, computer. An EM field that would work, a, a computer that would work, compute through EM fields as well as wires. And we had some ideas for how we would do it. We just need transistors that were sensitive to EM fields. And actually, I describe that it's actually uh, in, in one of my earlier papers, 
a fascinating experiment done by the Coggs group at the University of Sussex, the other university we keep getting confused with, in Brighton. And um, the researchers there evolved a circuit to do a task. And this was using... Oh, yeah. um, An FPGA. Um, FPA chips, yeah. yes, exactly. They evolved this circuit to do a task. It was recognised a musical note. Uh, and they resolved it using a, um, an evolutionary algorithm to uh, configure the FBA chips in, in lots of different ways. They tried out it with 100 different chips and <clears throat> found the circuit would work, work best, cloned the others into that configuration, mutated them, and through I many remember. cycles of, uh, of uh, mutation and uh, essentially artificial selection, they got a chip that worked. But it was yeah. strange. They, it didn't work all the time, and they uh, tracked down why it didn't work. It only worked when the radio was on. That's really <laughs> weird, isn't it? Yeah, because I didn't know that bit about the story. Out, they, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if it's in the paper. I actually went to see the guy, Andy, so again, I never remember his name. Andy, so I, meant, I met him, and he told me this. They worked it out. It, was, um, it only worked when the radio was on because they did all this work out of hours when – you know, when they were meant to be working on the real projects that were paid to work on during the day. In the evening, they'd have a go at doing this and they'd have the lab radio on. And so this chip was evolved with the lab radio on. So it was using the computations that were modulated yeah. by the lab radio, by the EM field. Yeah. And when they removed that EM field by turning the radio off, it didn't work. Yeah. And so, the, the componentry on the FPGA that evolved they weren't connected to each other that's as far right, as i remember yes, exactly. like, so the, the cells yeah. in the on the chip were literally disconnected from each other it wasn't yeah. even a circuit and yeah, yet it was exactly. the thing that solved the problem it's amazing in, inputs weren't connected to the outputs and this to yeah. me is the most fascinating yeah. experiment that's never been followed up on and that was the kind of thing that we yeah. said we were going to do and of course we're turned down by the eu funding committee but i think there's Huge. Yeah. I mean, essentially what we're propose, proposing is to build a computer that computes through fields as well as wires. Yeah, well, that's and the what prediction I'm of it is, Yeah, it would be fantastic. And if, yeah. if you do get funded, if I can help in yeah. any way, I really... You know, I, I'll, I'll talk to you because, about it later. That uh, wasn't actually my question. I just... Okay, right. right, it, right. Went, it went to a great place. But um, I, I, I'm wondering if you can draw any contrast between your work and sue pocket yourself and sue pocket are kind of like my uh the the heroes of the pro, of the remaining yeah. people who are left in it and i don't know if you've had any um interaction with yes, her. yes i did uh, i did have interaction with sue early on really weird um me sue yeah. pocket and um uh, the fingalhurst brothers yeah. uh, came up with the idea more or less at the same time. And, and as far as yeah. I, I know, no one came up with an EM field theory of consciousness until three of us came up with it in, in one or two years. And it's not yeah. quite clear who was the first, and I'm not going to claim to be the first. But Sue's um, uh, theory is very similar to mine, except she doesn't have an output. She, um, in her theory, consciousness doesn't have an output. And that to me doesn't mm. make sense. Why are we talking about consciousness if it doesn't have an output? It clearly has an output. Our conscious mind is what's speaking. So there must be some way that our conscious mind gets out. But in Sue's, she doesn't think that it does. I can't remember her argument why, but she does have an argument why. She yeah, thinks. she's very concerned about free will and uh, she, yeah. issues around that. And uh, she's kind of um, off the planet pretty much at the moment so yeah uh, it's very hard to get in touch with her and get her to talk about it because she's gone all strange on it anyway i just I thought i'd ask if had a bad you, experience with her university and um and yeah she's been disappointed and also she's had some health issues people. as well which yeah kept her offline. Well, we have communicated um by email first and then i met her at a meeting a number of years ago and we, uh, we talked and we're we're perfectly uh, happy with each other and acknowledge each other when we talk mm. about the field. We, and we don't, I don't think either of us claims priority. We'll just kind of say about the same time because mm. it was so close in time. It's kind of spooky. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it's funny how ideas do that. Maybe, and, and maybe I had a similar thing. DM field was saying someone needs to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. I had the same thing happen to me uh, at, at the same time. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in academia. I actually had to get into academia to. 
even begin to talk about it. So there you go. Okay, um, well, that's yeah. irrelevant, but I'll yeah. I'll pass on to Nikki. Some okay. ideas have their time, I think, and maybe yeah. it was an idea. Yeah, it's time for this one for sure. Yeah. And, and a quick note there, actually, Mosin, who is our silent partner here, wrote a great paper in 2013 looking at the history of EM field theories of consciousness. And it goes back a bit further than you, jo John, Joe, not okay. to steal your thunder there. Oh, right. okay. uh, but were they, being... you know, there were field theories of consciousness. Popper, for example, uh, had a field theory of consciousness. And Benjamin Libet also came up with a field theory. But they weren't <laughs> EM fields. They didn't propose the EM field was the theory. Uh, was the source of consciousness as far as i'm aware there's a few um, other em field theories that go further back than that but... okay i will have a look at that paper Bibram and eroy john and a few others and uh to a certain extent um uh walter freeman uh, and there's a mm. bunch of them but the thing is that yourself and Supok, but, uh, and the finkel kurtz are actually alive uh, and everyone else yeah. is gone which is really sad yeah yeah nikki go ahead Okay, cool. Well, John Joe, very interesting theory. It's um, Thank you. Uh, I've seen so many references to your work that it's kind of surreal, like interacting with you in person. So very cool. But um, I really like your thoughts on uh, free will as well. It's funny. Mm. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had some very similar thoughts while mind wandering while dancing <laughs> in uh, Golden Gate Park. But basically um, this idea and, and by the way, my personal interest is uh, the neural correlates of transpersonal psychology. So in my version, you know, um, sort of this idea of maybe tapping into uh, a non-local source, which then sends down a signal um, sort of which is initially executed by the subconscious mind, but then at a certain point, the conscious mind has the opportunity to veto or to change mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. so here you have the paradox of um, free will and determinism. So both of them, this like signal that comes down um, almost like a Google auto suggest. And then we have the opportunity to consciously like override that signal. So um, pretty interesting, okay. but uh, also going circling back to, that point about um, there just being one electromagnetic field. Uh, in my mind, I would kind of equate that with uh, primary process states and the um, free energy principle or Bayesian brain or entropic brain theory yeah. of um, Robin Carhart Harris or uh, implicate order, um, David Bohm, or uh, we had John Johan Kepler on talking about the zero point field. Um, but similar to, I think, Jonathan and and Tam, um, maybe this idea of integration is the, the nested hierarchy, these nested um, uh, observer windows. And um, it's funny. So this past weekend, I was in Ukiah and I had this amazing ego dissolution experience and was kind of picturing uh, nested observer windows, kind of like this uh, multi-layer fountain where you have um, the primary process state or the zero point field or, or whatever you want to call that, you know, being at the top and then sort of like uh, flowing down to these different levels, very similar to the structure of like the tree of life in Kabbalah. So um, okay. pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a fascinating area. I think it's only really thinking about there is only a singular EM field. Um, I think, and I wonder where to go with this because then you kind of ask, well, where do your thoughts go? Essentially, in quantum mechanics, information is neither, it can't be destroyed. It's not, it can be created, but it can't be destroyed once it's created. So every thought that you have is still out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and as, for example, what happens when you die? Does your brain, does, does your, the information, is it still there somewhere in the universe? And uh, another way of thinking about it is, is our brain the output of the universe's CMI field? And does it have many outputs? All of the people in the, in the universe are the outputs of the universe's CMI field. And I don't know where to go. That's, I'm not I try to veer away from mysticism because so much in the consciousness area, it gets muddled with mysticism and then it goes all cloudy and mystical and, and it loses sight of science. So I don't know. Really somebody to go should there. build a chip and actually find out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That would be have a precise, as a field, do we have a precise definition of mysticism? I haven't found one. 
I neither, uh, well, I have a precise definition of science, um, but um, which is described in my recent book I mentioned, that it's science is all about finding a simpler solution to things. Yeah. And mysticism usually invents stuff that you don't really need to account for the data. Right, it's creative. Like maybe a mystical thing would be if I take my vitamin and I'm like, I, I take meaning out of the number of vitamins that I have. Like that might be yeah, more mystical. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's some, pretty precise. Yeah, that's a precise definition. If it's just imaginative, like meaning attribution, um, yeah. so there's experiential magical state thinking. That... Magical thinking would be mysticism. Yes, I, I think. Yeah, so. but you have to be more, be more precise Thank because you, if you don't, if you say magical thinking, then it spirals out of control into like. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say possibilities. Yeah, I feel like that's just one small area of, of the larger umbrella of mysticism. So, mm. so we're at time. I think in, in going back to Nikki's question about free will, I think it is interesting um, what, that free, what free will is in the theory, because I think we've had a lot of problems with free will and deciding what it is. Um, and I think it comes actually, it comes actually, the problems come from, from mysticism, religion. It actually, if you go back to ancient civilizations, they didn't really believe in free will. They, they believed in fate more often, that things happen because the gods make them happen. And, you know, Oedipus, for example, uh, was fated to uh, kill his father because, uh, and his father was told this when Oedipus was born, and he leaves Oedipus on the mountainside to, to die, but some shepherd picks him up and he grows up. And when Oedipus grows up, he meets his father at the crossroads and doesn't recognize his father, so he kills him. So even though Oedipus's father tried to avoid what was going to happen, it happened. So this was how I think most ancient cultures free, uh, felt. Human nature didn't really have free will. We were subject to the whims of the gods. Yeah. People um came... Uh, sorry, just uh, go on uh, to it, and then uh, I'll let you jump in again. Nick. And the free will came in in Western culture more than any other culture, because in the medieval world, we wanted to punish people, and we wanted to separate people from those who should go to heaven, the good people, and those that should go to hell. Mm -hmm. And it had to be through the free choices, mm -hmm. because if God was going to send someone to hell and torture them for all eternity, there better be a good reason for it. And at that time, determinism really came into the argument because people like William of Ockham, the guy I'm very interested in, said, well, if God knows everything, he's the driver of everything. So why is it that we're punishing people when God has made them do these things? So the church has held on to this vision of free will in order to avoid determinism, whether it's thick determinism coming from a God or determinism of the universe. They want to believe that people take free choices so we can punish them. And from a religious perspective, some of them can go to heaven and some of them can go to hell. But that isn't how we understand free will. And people get mixed up with determinism and free will. If you think about what we mean by free will, it's actually the conscious control of our actions. And that doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily non-deterministic. If I, for example, choose to lift my hand now you could say okay that's my free will but it's caused by the fact that i'm in this conversation with you guys and it's just come up and and tam invited me to give this talk so it isn't free it's caused by lots of other things that happened beforehand and if we think about what we do at any time in the day like you know somehow your um your uncle comes into your mind or something like this and you think well where did it come from and if you think hard enough you always find a reason for it. Oh, someone on the tv looked like him and that's why he, I, I called him and, and and that kind of thing you will always find a reason so in fact as we experience free will it isn't non-deterministic but what it is is our conscious mind taking control and it's real because then our conscious mind takes over and we become responsible as people who have responsibilities. Whereas the non-conscious things we do, like me waving my hands around, if I bang them into someone, they may blame me, but I don't really blame myself because I'm not aware of it. But the stuff we're aware of, we believe we're responsible for. So it's our conscious mind driven actions. And that's what free will is in my theory. And I think it's rescuing free will from determinism. In, uh, in the sense that it's something different from say, mere brute computation. Our conscious mind is in the driving 
in the driving seat for our conscious actions. And I think that to me is free will. It's something different. Whereas in most other theories of consciousness, they just say, well, it doesn't exist. I think it exists because we have actions that we aren't conscious of and actions that we are. And those of the latter type are those driven by our conscious mind, which is where our personality is, where our ideas are. And that's the only thing that we give responsibility to. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, Robert Sapolsky recently wrote a, a book on free will. And I don't know if you've seen any uh, recent YouTube videos with him no, talking about this that. topic, but oh, people okay. just hammer him. He's totally non-deterministic and it just, it just doesn't seem like, uh, okay. it's, yeah. it seems like we got to have at least a little bit. But I'm, I'm glad you circled back to this too, because that was the other piece of, of thinking about it. So I think the evolution of consciousness is gaining more and more of an ability to override that subconscious signal absolutely and what's interesting too is i think it gets to the point where um you know we we raise to the level where now we're automating tasks down here so we're mm. we're putting it all subconscious and this might be the link to mind wandering so mm. you know we we take a lot of tasks that are just repetitive and just start automating these things so that we can think about higher and higher order um, subjects. Mm. So pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, I think, no, Super I think interesting, that's... yeah. Yeah. And, and sorry, we're well over time. So okay. Okay. I want to just ask one final question. And John, if you could really briefly address um, how to test your theory, then we'll, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, ultimately, I think it'll only be tested in AI because I don't really see any way that you could, all I can do other than that is look at correlates and the correlates are all there already. Um, you, we can study things like how much impact EM fields have on urines and I have a project in my lab looking at that. But ultimately, it can only be proved, I think, by creating an artificial consciousness. That's what um, my theory predicts that that should be possible with a different kind of configuration of how computers would be built. And that I think would be the only way. Um, and, and the other half of that is that you'll never build one without that kind of configuration in which EM fields play a role in the computation. But how do you assess if the AI is conscious or not? Uh, well, that's, I, I, I kind of come back to the kind of Turing test kind of, but you've got to ha be a bit more intelligent. I know some computers are said to have, uh, um, uh, pass the Turing test, but I think I think would know. I mean, I I don't have any any problem in recognizing conscious entities. I kind of with dogs and cats and things like this. I wonder whether they're conscious or not. But when I when I see someone who's conscious, I don't have any doubt about it. I, I, I have some ideas on that. I've been thinking about this for a long time. <clears throat> so okay. perhaps we should talk uh, the t consciousness <laughs> test part. Yeah. It's all about novelty. I, I kind of think it's kind of like the question about life. It's hard to define life, but it's easy to spot it. It's not, uh, yeah, there are some uh, areas where you might think, is it alive or dead? But actually, there seems to be a cl very clear distinction. And I think it might be with consciousness as well. It's hard to define. It's hard to kind of say this is the border. But um, we know when we're well over it. And certainly human beings are... Well, thanks so much, uh, John. You're really good stuff and great discussion. Um, we did record this, so I'll um, send this out to the group and um, look forward to hearing more. Okay, great to talk to you all. Very all right. great to all right. talk about Fantastic. this Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. On behalf of the entire General Residence Theory team, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, share it, add a comment, and subscribe for more content. We'll see you next time.